Next up, we have Mr. Lalit Sharma amongst us. Welcome, Mr. Lalit Sharma. A quick introduction about Mr. Lalit Sharma. Mr. Lalit Sharma worked on policy aspects mainly in the capacity of program coordinator and technical expert with the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change for six years in an interface of JIS. Mr. Lalit Sharma will be presenting on the end of life vehicles, recycling in India, challenges, prospects, and potential with respect to natural resource management. The stage is all yours, sir. Thank you so very much for the brief introduction. I hope I am audible and visible uh, and also my slide is also there in front of you all. Uh, very good afternoon and I wish and pray everyone remains uh, safe. Uh, to begin with, uh, I have been a part of uh, uh, the ministry but as of now I am working and I am back in GIZ. Today I am presenting as a, uh, as a researcher because I am almost about to finish my research on end of life vehicles. Uh, as far as today's presentation is concerned, first thing first, thank you for this opportunity. I would be, I would be presenting this, uh, this element of end of life vehicle, keeping the natural resource scarcity and the management aspects which are imbibed there in, in the end of life vehicle as a potential. So that would be my, uh, my, my approach to the presentation. Um, to begin with, let me take you, uh, just to set the tone of this to this specific study which is uh, uh, the global material resource extraction if on 108 years we plot this specific uh, material extraction uh, it was amazing to understand and find out that from 1900 uh, when the when the when the usage was only 8 billion tons to 1980 it became it was a long time to get on to uh, 35 billion tons. But from 1980 to 210, within 30 years, from 35 billions, we are 70 billion consumptions. Point is that the rate of extraction and the speed of extraction of the natural resources has been so high that we have to ask ourselves that by 2050, are we going to have any kind of resources or what kind of resources left with us to go ahead? when we talk about so that was that was uh, that is very important to understand when we talk about the resources if you even talk about in terms of india as per this study you will see the extraction rates have been really very very high it was 2.5 billions and by 2010 it was 5 billions looking into the past the projections made by this study shows us that it would be somewhere in the tune of 15 to 25 tons by 2050. It is already reported that India has highest resource extraction pressure, which is almost 1500 tons per acre. And if we compare it with the global, it is three times than the global average. So uh, the scenario in India, if I may say so, is even alarming because yes, for obvious reason, we are developing and we do need some kind of these kind of resources. The point is, that when there is so much of resource extraction and resource extraction pressure, uh, what is something which we can do or we should do? Either we decrease the global material use, is it possible? It is not possible, so we leave this specific aspect. Is there a possibility that at least we try to stabilize it to some present extent? Uh, I think the answer would be yes, maybe we can do that. And particularly when we talk about the countries in the like India and China in the Asia Pacific, we have 50% plus population of the globe resides. Whatsoever decision being done in this part is going to have the global impact. That's why decisions may be late, but they have to be judicious. They have to be sustainable. And that's where I would just like to connect this with the specific subject that how when we are talking about that, can we stabilize or can we contribute to some extent that we try to stabilize the resource extraction rate to some extent, the answer will lie in here that we'll have to, you know, this can be achieved uh, by efficiently using the resources and not only uh, throughout the material life cycle of extraction, production, consumption, but also in the post consumption stage when we are looking at waste as waste. We don't have to look at waste as waste, but we'll have to look at, at a resource and have to bring the circular economy approaches by doing so. To some extent, I'm sure you all would also agree that uh, 
it would help in stabilizing the resource extraction to the present extent. And when we talk of end of life, the subject of today, it is one such waste stream, if tackled really judicially, will surely contribute to the natural resource scarcity of the country and of to the globe. When we talk of end of life management, I've uh, been a part of the presentation since morning. Uh, there is an ISO standard 22628 already established there, wherein one has to go through these process when we are talking about the ELB management of the global practices. When we say global practices, the peoples who are already having, the countries who are already having not only the regulations, but the mechanisms, that's how they are doing it. They do the pre-treatment where they have, we call it normally uh, in other terms, a depollution part of it. You take out the fluids, batteries, and all other kind of things. That's the pre-treatment. Then you go for dismantling, bailing, shredding, metal recovery, post shredder techniques when you do the metal recovering i will get into some other slides and then finally is the landfill and we all are aware of it that the laws are so very stringent when we talk about uh, the developing nations uh, who are practicing the end of life management in this specific way to take just quote one example in europe i think it is just 5% of the input material which they can only landfill and rest of that is to be somehow recovered in other terms if we see it specifically we would find out that this process has almost, uh, when we talk about, if you look into the left top, bottom, you have a vehicle, it is end of life vehicle, it goes through deep pollution, extracting out all the haphazards, all the fluids and all other kind of things. And then gradually it goes for the dismantlers, hulk, bailed hulk, pre-shredders. And then once this is done, it goes into the heavy, uh, what do you call hammer mills, the shredding machines. What happens there, we will not get into the details of them. These are very, uh, very energy intensive and very huge plants where you have various kind of techniques which comes across together to take the ferrous and the non-ferrous part from that specific material, which was the input. Like you have uh, magnetic drums, so you get the ferrous materials out. Uh, the red boxes are something which I would like you to concentrate a little bit on. These are actually the fluff materials we call in some other words, auto shredder residue asr which is the waste coming out of it and what i would like to highlight over here is it is almost 20 to 25 percent of the input material when we talk about this now 20 to 25 percent of material going as a waste is not a very economic solution that's why they further go for the post shredder techniques wherein they already have the already have the global uh, experience saying that incineration thermal chemical processes like paralysis and gasifications are proven to take out the resources out of it. So it is the, it is the, it is the auto shredder residue, which uh, I would uh, like you to just be with me on this specific slide. When we look at it, it not only has the resource potential, but it has a different element or landscape of hazardousness to it. When we talk about the resources in it, there are ample of, you see in this specific study, plastics up to the range of 35, rubber, metals to the range of 6 to 13, textiles and whatnot. So these values or resources should be extracted. But when we talk about that, what are the hazardous part, you would see that there are even lead, cadmium, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls and other kind of things. Some countries even have declared it hazardous waste. When we even talk about the auto shredder residues treatment in the post shredder techniques, which I've shown in the earliest time, it is one of the most difficult and pretty expensive one. Since the dioxin related compounds, uh, brominated flame retardants are used extensively in the vehicles, heavy metals, flame retardants, uh, which are with the persistent organic uh, pollutants often remain in this auto shredder residue, which is the waste of uh, ELB and may include unintentional generation of the pops, which is even dangerous. So what I'm trying to just underline here is that even uh, the players who are uh, the global players in ELB management have been dealing with this specific uh, challenge of auto shredder residues. Point is, uh, are we sure that whether this specific auto shredder residue is going to get down or reduce? Answer would be no, as one of the presenter already have mentioned. Just have a look to these 20 years study. You will find that the ferrous metal onto the left side is decreasing extensively and the non-ferrous metal and the plastics and the textiles are increasing. It is such kind of plastics and the textiles which is increasing just to make fuel efficient car uh, because of which uh, the, the amount of usage of these components is increasing. 
and who is responsible mainly if you talk about the character of asr for it is these plastics and textiles and such kind of components which are major junk which is responsible for making the auto shredder residue in the time to come that's why they are not going to reduced even if we look at the shredder plants they are if this is just one from uh, italian this is just one sketch they are very uh, extensive plants have the conveyor belts density separator cyclone venturi tubes and what not and when we talk about in terms of the um, energy it was just from one of the energy audit from one of the specific one just let's have on to the uh, left side you will see that uh, top left there was 44 units per ton of input material uh which was uh, you know which uh, this much of energy is utilized when we talk about so that's how energy intensive these specific productions or these specific plants are if you just convert them into uh the co2 equivalent the left top left down bottom you will find they are in the tune of uh, if we just consider one motor of 300 hp 8 hours operation it would be somewhere in the tune of uh 14 uh you know uh, 1000 tons co2 equivalent per day so very energy intensive so what what is the problem statement what i'm trying to say uh, resource deficiency surely is there use of waste or resource we have to make a decision end of life vehicles give a high potential auto shredder residue which is the waste of elv is 20 to 25% it has the resource but also has the hazard component into it when we talk about the process itself it is carbon and energy intensive when we talk about the recovery targets they are anyway stringent and they are going to further get stringent and when we talk about the further investment there are already in, uh, a huge investment in the shredder and such kind of techniques but when you go for cross shredder techniques they are further increasing so if we talk about india you see uh, we are almost uh, at the bottom ladder we are 99% been uh, you know elv has been tackled by the informal segment we don't have much of law with us so we have a huge uh, way to uh, further go across into there is a long road to it i'll not get into this people uh, the only segment uh, or the only statement is the automobile segment in india has been booming since 30 years and i see it is going to get further the research study which i am going to present in next of the slide was only concentrating on the passenger car i need to mention it in here because it's not catering what i'm going to show you the overall elv but just the passenger part of it that's how we all are aware of it that how does the indian informal segment looks like it is not only in uh, delhi mayapuri but several parts you will see that you will see on to the left side in the bottom i have spent quite a lot of time while doing this research in the field uh, you will see all the left all all the all the all the all the play the blue shutters and all this are the fabricators of one or the other kinds and that's how they work together i mean together in the sense that this is the haphazard crude methods which they are using they they simply use the crude methods i'll not dig into it because most of us knows it these are some of the actual pictures that i must mention and underline it it is not so very easy to get into these informal sectors and take the pictures there are few i'm sure few people who are in the uh, in this uh, in this uh, workshop today would also agree to it but just to give you the glimpse of it how does this works these four five people i have done 18 or 20 of such kind of dismantlings and we've used five of the samples for the study within 40 minutes to 1 hour to 1 and 1/2 hours four five people just dismantle it like this you see the circularity of it and the car absolutely ends up into a hulk and the rest of the part are taking here and there whatsoever is their next step to go in even they go further then sometimes the engine is not so very in a good conditions they even dismantle it and try to you know segregate iron part and aluminum part to an extent that all these people in these 1 hour 1 and 1/2 hours or 2 hours are constantly working in a very bad uh, haphazard manners but somehow trying to extract out whatsoever potentially is possible when we talk about these uh, people and finally that's how uh, the small trash is left over so if we just put this overall landscape of informal segment that's what we get you see on to the top left there are car oi users end of life vehicles dismantlers uh, with the dismantlers like in these kind of uh, areas i have just shared you will get various kinds of traders who are the first which is there in the first box primary kind of secondary kind of tertiary kind of there in itself are parts and trade into those parts which are usable 
there is a second hand market also available there is a second hand part market also available so we all are aware of it but this was just an attempt to put all this informal landfill uh, informal elv segment of india into a spe specific uh, uh, bracket that how does it looks like uh, finally they make in terms of iron if i talk about such kind of ballots and these uh, uh, people who are dealing with the uh, different kind of parts, they take those specific parts and they use them some or the other way. But when I talk in terms from where I've started in ISO 22628, uh, we are really standing uh, almost nowhere because whatsoever we are doing, basically uh, the formal setup is just a new baby. Informal setup is the one which is taken care of and we are not even doing the pretreatment in the proper way. Uh, we are not even doing the depollution in proper. So that's why it's a... It's a long story, long, long way where we have to go. Uh, credit to uh, my uh, dear, uh, one of uh, the presenters in one of the workshops, Mr. Sujit Somdar. This picture is from him. This is how the this kind of informal, uh, uh, you know, markets looks like. My intention to tell you is that okay, they 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 do look in a very haphazard manner and all that. But if you just go to this gentleman who is sitting there and ask for a specific particular car door or a specific part. He will go and immediately take out, though they don't have any inventories and all such kind of things. So what I'm trying to say is, okay, they are doing a not very good job, but there is a slight amount of uh, slight amount of knowledge which do exist with these specific uh, informal uh, players. Uh, I'll just put upon one part, one of the case of iron, that how this iron has been moving. We have done it for the aluminium and other parts also. Be with me on the ELV, which is the red box. It goes to the dismantle, and then there are iron. Uh, scrap dealers within the areas like Mayapuri, they give it to the secondary ones, they give it to the tertiary ones. And then finally, in this case, we have been able to uh, investigate with the Mand uh, Mandi Gobindagar Fatehpur, uh, which is also called as uh, the steel city or the Loha Mandi, where there are quite a number of induction electronic arc furnaces where they do uh, have the mild steel, they make ingots and ballots, they have the steel rolling mills and the pipe mills. So um, what comes out of it, if you see in terms of percentage, I'll not touch upon various parts, but what is interesting is that whatever amount which was coming from these kind of scraps, if you go down into Mandi Gobindgarh and go down, there are three major segments wherein this goes. Construction, uh, others majorly goes to the constructions for the channel beam, annual angle, TMT bars. We are all aware of it, but we found interestingly, there was a sum amount which was even coming into the mobility sectors in this specific specific sector in this specific geographical location there were uh, some uh, automobile company manufacturers who have been taking all such kind of things because they were making their further components like round bars square bars flat bars galvanizing coils and all that from this material which is coming and as a uh, uh, as we talk about the circularity, so there was a small amount of circularity in this specific case examples, which was uh, which was attempted in there. These were the uh, the bottom segment. You see uh, some of the parts which were coming out of the material iron from the ELV segment uh, within themselves. These were the five samples we have done, and we have uh, uh, we have dismantled them and have tried to classify them. Uh, in terms that what are the characteristics and India's uh, characteristics are also not very different from the global one. We have almost 76% iron and then aluminum and then rest of the components into it. We even calculated the recyclability and recoverability potential. I must underline it only the potential of hatchback, the second underlined car, as I've mentioned. And to your surprise in these five segments, when we have done this experiment on the basis of a specific method, which is available, because this was one of the highlight of this study, uh, there are not much of the methods available for identifying the recyclability, recoverability of informal segment. But we have tried to uh, come across with one, uh, which is mentioned in AIS 1 to 9, uh, the method and we have tried to come across with that the potential when we talk about the dismantler was pretty uh, satisfactory up to 88 percent and 91 percent and when we when we talk about such kind of uh, uh, recyclability potentials of of the formal uh, the shredder plants uh, it would be of interest to you that sometimes uh, it is somewhere in the range of 75 to 80 or 85 so because as i mentioned 20 to 25 percent out of those shredder is the waste auto shredder residue so uh, dismantling, only that dismantling potential uh, was interesting uh, to
to be there in the range of uh, 88 to 91. When we convert that, and we have done it only for aluminum and iron, when we convert that over the period, you would see that the iron recovery from the only hatchback segment will increase from approximately 0.71 million tons to 4 million tons. One of our colleagues already have mentioned that uh, in, uh, I think it was uh, the first presenter, sir, uh, it would be 10 million in terms of iron and it absolutely collides with that because this is only hatchback. There are quite n number of significant and hatchback is only uh, one component out of the 14 percent. So it is absolutely, absolutely evident from this specific work also, which we have carried out in this study. Same is with the case of aluminium. And if I connect it uh, to where I started, all these contributions from the end of life sector are surely going to address to some extent to the resource scarcity of India and so to say of globe. All this is published already in this specific research paper last year. And in my presentation, this would also be available. Uh, so my concluding three slides, sorry, I think yes, I, yes, I, yes, yes, I've seen just one minute and I will be coming to it. I am trying to keep the time. Thank you for reminding me. So uh, when I when I, if I just try to conclude it, what is what is the way forward when you talk about the resource potential from the end of life vehicle? 99% informal, we do understand. It is the depollution part which is creating huge problem. You also will agree to me because it is the most critical part and they are not taking care of. India, if we talk about point number two, uh, we may think of not going for the expensive systems of ELV treatment, uh, but we'll have to indigenize something because these things are possible in US, Europe, uh, because uh, the labor cost there is so very high. And in India, it is not so very high. That's why probably we can go. And the study already have proven that uh, dismantling is something which uh, they are also looking forward for. A uh, concept of DFR, like designed for recycling, designed for dismantling, eco-designing, have to be brought into the policy domain to enhance circular economy concept, uh, which will further enhance the overall uh, resource uh, scarcity challenge. Uh, I may skip these uh, three parts, but uh, uh, the point is, which I would like to mention, the fourth point, this specific sector, only dismantlers I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the overall value chain. Overall value chains, there are n number of inefficiencies. We just study the dismantler and its network, if you talk about, it's, it's, it's a huge employment when we talk about these. They do have something in them which they are carrying forward since decades. I think it's four or five decades in case of Mayapuri it was happening. So maybe something should be tried with them, uh, of course, with the government interventions. Probably they can be extended hence to the formal setups or there has to be some other uh, things to be carried out. My final slide, uh, before my final slide. So uh, what I would say is that dismantler or manual dismantling is an appropriate step to consider in the overall ELV management chain, especially in developing country. So the Indian process shall also be encouraged because this is also been you know, justified by the developed nations who have the ELV that the intensive dismantling is good. I have three examples. I'll take only two of them from the box. They remove car seats because they put the car absolute vehicle into the shutter. If they remove the car seats, they play an important role in the generation of auto shutter residue because they are the main source of the polyurethane resin PUR textiles accounting for more than 20%. So just by removing the seats, 20% of the weight of or the waste ASR is reduced. Same was the case with the remove the bumper tiles, fuel tanks in another study. It was 30%. That means approximately 7% of the recycling rate have increased. So uh, what I would just like to say towards the end, my last statement written into the bottom is manual dismantlers has been you know recycling and having a good recoverable potential against all the odds. So these shall be integrated uh, with the formal setups in some or the other way. Uh, of course, depollution practices shall be addressed challenge. This is a challenge. They should be addressed in an appropriate manner so that we can bring this specific value into it. So when we talk about the ELV waste stream, there is a huge potential and it can contribute to some extent to the global resource scarcity via circular economy. If we really bring them back into the value chain by giving our cars at end of life, uh, this somehow gives uh, some smile. But the last statement would be they are to some extent, some kind of an craftsman, but this is not the India we want. This is not the process we want. And definitely they cannot flourish with what they are doing and the method which they are doing. With this, I will come to uh, the end. I hope I did justice to the time and thank you for being very uh, wonderful audience. I have to stop share and come back to the screen to see, I guess that 
uh, I can look into the questions. Uh, I hope I'm there now and open for it. Thank you so very much for being there with me. Uh, thank you so much, Lalit Sharma. Uh, now we are up for question and answers. So everyone can post their queries in the question section. Mr. Lalit Sharma will be handling them from, from there. So we have first question from Arun Dilipan. He has asked us, as known, we are about to have ELP policy in the force in the near, near future. Uh, if I may answer, I've seen it. Uh, uh, see, definitely uh, the way it has been done, we cannot, even the informal ELV sector, if we give everything, they don't have the capacity to uh, take care of it. And the second point is that we don't want uh, them to work like that. The third point is that the formal setup is coming up. They have high, uh, very high expectations from this specific, uh, the market. You see, uh, uh, we can quote an example, if I'm allowed to, of one of the company, which uh, already have, I think, 29 uh, such kind of uh, uh, plants, which they are going to come across in very few, I think, by next year. And in next few years, they are going up to 200. There are other companies also which are coming. I even have some information that in uh, there are uh, there are some organizations which are coming up with putting some sort of shredders, uh, which are to the tune of Indian conditions and all that. So my answer would be that uh, it has to be changed. And uh, uh, with this policy, the segment is going to grow like or, uh, you know, flourish like anything. Probably uh, what is required is that we all have to work together as it is also described in CPCB's guidelines that there has to be shared responsibility that can be an answer which somehow or the other advocate about the extended producer responsibility. But the answer to your question would be, uh, there is a huge market and scope and economy and the business case in this specific one. I think there is another one, uh, the question. I hope I did uh, some justice to your question, my dear friend. Uh, this is, uh, are there any policy considerations of ELV recycling parts? Okay, uh, well, I do have uh, heard of it when during my tenure in the ministry, there were some such kind of discussions going on uh, to have the parks not specific to a specific like end of life vehicle or that, but probably uh, I would not be in a domain to answer that specific question. Uh, the next one is that uh, what kind of a cost difference can we expect in dismantling in formal and informal setups? Well, uh, as of now, uh, the amount which we get in the informal sector is a little higher than what we are getting in the formal setup. And the other thing is in the informal segment, the business model is cash. They don't go for inventories and all this, nothing straight away, uh, the money comes. That's why people are most of the time more comfortable getting in touch with them rather than going for the formal part, which is not a very good practice. Uh, if we have to really make change, we have to be a part of uh, the solution, not to the problem. So we have to look forward that how can we also get in touch with the formal players who are, who are coming up very strongly. Uh, sorry to interrupt Mr. Lalit Sharma. Further, the questions can be uh, handled on his uh, Gmail account. All of you can uh, contact him on his personal email ID that we have been uh, sharing that on live chat. So I've just shared his email. You all can contact him for, for further queries. Thank you, Mr. Lalit Sharma, for presenting your views on the topic. We were pleased to have you on this stage. We are looking forward for further Thank you. It was a pleasure. and contact with you. Thank you so much. This session. Thank you so very much. The next session will begin shortly. Thank you. 